Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Hello and thank you for joining us on Deeper, your daily Bible study. What a blessing it is to come together on Wednesday, June 12th, here in the study of today's lesson. The title is Toward a First Generation Faith. And I think it's a very beautiful and fitting title for us who have, for many of us, we are not the first generation of Adventism. We have probably parents and grandparents and and some of our listeners probably have uh, great-grandparents that are were Adventists or were in the faith. But uh, what does this mean toward a first generation faith? We're going to discuss and dive in, right into it. But before we start, we want to ask that you will accompany us in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you today for a blessing to come together and to allowing us this time to spend in your word. We seek to do your will, and we want to be able to not only just know in our minds, but to practice them and, and bring that experience to our lives and our families that uh, they can really, uh, we can all be blessed and realize that we have faith that is true and genuine and is active in our lives. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and for your Holy Spirit that we seek and we ask of his presence in the midst right now. We pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, today, we have the lesson brought a few concepts in regards to this idea of third generation faith. Uh, first of all, the lesson brought the, you know, right that after, right after Joshua, when he died, uh, it was in a very few years that the children of Israel forgot their faith, their leader, or they forgot what he had instructed them when he called them, you know, to follow the Lord or, you know, and choose for themselves who to follow. Um, they forgot very, you know, right, very soon, right after. And, uh, that, we have the book of Judges, with a book of full of, you know, leaving the faith and coming back after many years of, you know, uh, uh, the opposition or oppression from from uh, someone else, from another uh, in nation that will invade them and, and conquer them for a minute, for a time or, or so. So we see that, you know, back and forth, back and forth. But it almost seems that this is a reason that happened to them because they... Uh, within a you know very short time, they will forget. The parents may be faithful, but the children forgot, and they left the faith. And so it was always this cycle. And we have to look into how we can uh, avoid that same mistake. And I believe, and I may be stepping on some, you know, some more family history or heritage there here, but uh, I believe this has happened the same to us, you know, as a church as a whole. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because we're still here. Uh, or, you know, there is, I just met a few young men who, um, who will tell me that he's a fifth generation Adventist. And I feel that, wow, that's, you know, <laughs> amazing to have five generations before us, yet still we're here on earth. And so some, somewhere along the line, we have uh, not kept the faith uh, that sh we should have. Uh, you know, God would have come and things would have done had we have kept the faith really in that uh, desire, in that fervent, in that uh, commission, you know, committed experience that the, our pioneers had. So let's go into that concept of what is first generation faith and why God does not have grandchildren, but children. So let's look into that uh, by studying, first of all, in Revelation chapter three. And Tim, if you don't mind reading for us chapter three of Revelation pages, oh, I'm sorry, um, verses 17 to uh, 15 to 17 and gives an idea of what this is about. Certainly. This is Jesus speaking here to the Laodicean church, which we understand to be not only historical uh, to a church in John's time, but also uh, prophetically to the church today. Jesus says, beginning in verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee, out of my mouth. And I'm going to interrupt myself here before I read verse 17. Mm -hmm. David, you just uh, referred to the Israelites following Joshua's death. They became complacent, didn't they? 
They didn't mm-hmm. complete the conquest of the land. They, be, they became content and satisfied with what had already been accomplished. And uh, a large part of their the source of their problems in the generations that followed was the fact that they did not complete the job that God had told them he wanted done. And um, they were, in this sense, neither cold nor hot. They were lukewarm in their devotion and zeal uh, to fully come in and take possession of the land of Canaan. So lessons for us, of course. Now I'll read verse 17. Jesus goes on here with his message to Laodicea, and he says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I don't know about you, David, but I don't like that list. That's that's not a good list of things, um, especially when it applies to me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it is in, it's sad that Christ refers to the last church, uh, prophetically speaking, and, uh, you know, which we understand is, is us, is our condition as the church that, that had received, that it had, you know, all, all, that, all that was available to them to really develop the, the perfect faith, to really have that seal, that desire to follow the Lord. And, and, and there was nothing that God did not do to provide for us knowledge, understanding, prophecy, and, and really uh, all the resources available. But yet this church that was blessed, you know, their condition is that they don't have the faith, that first generation faith, as we are talking here. It's more of that, uh, you know, complacent attitude. Like, we, are, we know we have it. We are, you know, we're the church mm-hmm. of God. We are, you know, really, you know, the, the, the chosen people of the Lord. Yet, because of that complacent, they don't really, they're not really following the Lord truly. And they're blind, naked, miserable, poor and blind. So, uh, like you said, not a good situation. And this is why we need to do something about that. You know, it's not enough to know that, you know, that you were raised in a church that has the principles of God and, and keeps the Sabbath holy. It's not enough that your parents were, you know, faithful to their church. It's, it's not enough to uh, even go to school, you know, uh, with the, your same, you know, um, religion, the same uh, church. But it's it's more than that. It has to be an experience where you are really alive in God. You're really alive in Christ, where you have a living faith. So let's read Revelation 3.18 and see the answer of Christ to the, our problem. You know, one of the wonderful things about Christ is that even as he is honest about our situation, he doesn't just leave us there wondering what to do. He gives advice. So here it is. Okay. Verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. A lot of good advice there, David. Amen. And the advice here we have... uh, you know, he says, be zealous and repent. So you have to repent. We have to do something about it. Staying in the situation or just learning that we have a condition and that there is an answer uh, is not enough. You have to do something. So let's look at the three things that briefly that Christ refers to in, in as, as, as a way that can restore in us that first generation of faith that we should we're supposed to have. Uh, the first thing is gold tried in the fire. Now, what kind of riches is Christ speaking of here and, 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 and really why? Can it only be obtained after it has been tried in the fire? Um, yeah, any thoughts, Tim, on, on about this? Well, there's a wonderful statement in Testimonies, Volume 5, that says the gold is faith and love. And, you know, faith, um, we can say we have faith, and we should say we have faith, but we don't really know that we have faith until we've been through an experience where it's been tested. And our faith, just like any muscle in our body, it will grow stronger and bigger the more we exercise it. Faith is the same. It must be exercised. And um, usually faith is exercised as we go through trials, as we go through those experiences in our lives where we don't see the end clearly, but we we must trust that God does and that he'll lead us there. So, you know, and as that happens, our love for Christ deepens as well. As we go through these experiences, hopefully with our families, 
you know, when people have been through a traumatic experience or a, a great trial or a deal or just an accomplishment, climbing a mountain, it bonds people together. And so we see that in this first bit of uh, counsel that Christ gives, this gold that is uh, tried in the fire, this is the faith and love that will bind us to Christ and to each other. Amen. And, you know, um, I was just thinking of, as you're mentioning, you know, what are the things that families are to do that will strengthen their faith? Uh, you know, I mean, we don't want certainly uh, t- to put our families through unnecessary stress or, or harm or, uh, you know, an, an issue that really it was because of our own choosing. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, how we how we really develop that faith in our children with our you know, with our kids. And I think that's why Christ chose as a ABC of education, agriculture. Uh, you know, many times today, no one is thinking of agriculture as a way of teaching the children. But if you think about it, you know, even that lesson, that simple lesson of going out there and having to be in the sun, in the heat, uh, having to work and, you know, take the weeds out and, and, and just work in the soil, to produce a little, you know, put a seed so that that seed can grow and takes time. It takes, it takes work. It takes hardship, but those experiences are fundamental uh, to the development of faith. As you trust in God and his care to provide the sun and the rain and the nutrients for the, for that seed to grow, you are helping your child understand not concepts, but experiences of what faith is about. And so th- I'm just talking of an example that, you know, that, that God wants our faith to grow. I mean, and of course, when something major happens in our lives, when there is an attack, uh, you know, from, you know, from those that are against the truth, if you have to go through experience where you are persecuted for your faith, well, those things will already have been there rooted in simple experiences where your family will continue, go forward. And this is how you really can have that, that goal that he mentions there. You know, and I think that's why uh, we have to analyze God's way is always best when it comes to our families, how to train them, how to teach your children. There has a lesson behind them that really helps and develop that faith. Um, but anyway, go ahead. You have something to say, Tim. Well, we've got uh, two minutes to cover the last two items here, so we'll move quickly. But another thing Jesus recommends to us is white raiment, which, uh, of course, represents the righteousness of Christ. And uh, not only should we accept what Christ has done for us, but it's also our privilege to accept what Christ wants to do in us and through us so that we can, if you were with us yesterday, like like Noah, we can walk with Jesus. We can live as he lived, uh, as he is living within us. And so this righteousness that comes only from Christ, um, but it's it's obtained through faith, is extremely important as well. And then the final thing that Christ recommends to us is eye salve that thou mayest see. He says, anoint thine eyes with it. You know, it's not just enough to hold it in our hands. We must apply that eye salve. And again, this statement from Testimonies, Volume 5, um, identifies the eye salve as that spiritual discernment, which will enable you to see the wiles of Satan and shun them, to detect sin and abhor it, to see truth and obey it. And this really is the indication of a character that has been transformed. As as Christ lives within us, as he washes the sin from our lives, we will begin to love the things that he loves, to hate the things that he hates. And as we do this day by day, uh, he matches uh, or he transforms us more and more into his image. So wish we had more time to look at that advice there, but a wonderful counsel from Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, Tim, and thank you for, for our listeners to, again, support us and to uh, come every day to listen to our program. We thank you that uh, you also have joined this program today, and we look forward to spending time in God's Word tomorrow. Thank you, and God bless you. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. 
To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.